Okay, session six, her journey begins with spiritual crisis. Chapter one, verse five to 11, let's read it. I am dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not look upon me because I am dark, because the sun has tanned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Tell me, O you whom I love, where you feed your flock, where you make it rest at noon. Or why, why should I be as one who veils herself by the flocks of your companions? And the Lord answers, if you do not know, O most beautiful or fairest among women, follow in the footsteps of the flock. Feed your little goats beside the shepherd's tents. I have compared you, my love, to my filly among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornament. Your neck with chains of gold. We will make you ornaments of gold. Chapter 1, verse 5 to 11. We've studied the theme of the song which reveals... The bride's resolutions and her commitments and her confessions of faith in the last session. Now the testimony of her actual journey, her spiritual journey, now begins. Up until this point in time, we've only seen her, the theme, her confessions, her resolutions. We didn't develop that, but that was in the notes. Last session was setting her course, was allowing us to know what was happening in terms of her vision and where she was going. But the paradox of grace is her first experience. She sees the reality of her sinful desires. But she also sees that she's lovely to God and her God-given passion for Jesus and her position in the grace of God. Her first revelation of Jesus is the counseling shepherd who compassionately teaches her the way forward in her weakness. What I'm going to do is take the next page or so, next uh, two pages, and give an illustration from Peter's life that is very applicable to this passage of Song of Solomon. It it makes the point so clear in his life that I want to tell that story, and then we'll have uh, an easier grid to understand this passage. During the Last Supper, Jesus warned Peter that Satan would test him in a way that Peter would end up denying the Lord. Several hours later, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus gave Peter a significant twofold description of how the redeemed heart works, how it operates. Peter did not understand these things about his heart, but we will use this twofold description throughout this session. And it's in Matthew 26, 41. Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. It's a twofold description that is significant to understanding how the grace of God operates in our life. Peter had weak flesh, but he also possessed a willing spirit. Peter stumbles because of his weak flesh. Yet he longs for Jesus because of his willing spirit. He has both of them operating in him. And we, again, we have to understand both dimensions of the redeemed heart to understand the grace of God in a more complete way. There is a greater capacity for sin in our hearts than we comprehend. No one fully grasps the depth of the weakness of the human heart. Jeremiah says the heart is deceitful above all things. The heart is desperately wicked. Who can really comprehend what it's capable of doing under the right pressures and the right circumstances? I'm talking about the weak flesh dimension of even the redeemed heart. Paul, as a mature apostle, grasped a measure of his sinfulness. He said as a mature apostle, he described himself as chief among sinners. This was not mock humility. It was not an exaggerated statement. I, I think it's possible that, that he understood more about his heart. And of course, he's referencing the fact that he killed believers. He actually uh, put them to death before his conversion. But it's more than just a historical uh, 
statement of how bad he was before the Lord. I believe he understands a little bit uh, more than, uh, or quite a bit more than most of us do about the capacity of the human heart. And this is important because, because it's, it's these things that confuse us at the end. Because when we understand a bit about our weak flesh, truth about who we are, but it's not the whole truth about who we are. Our flesh is weaker than we know. And here's the point uh, that I was making a moment ago. We are sometimes surprised when we commit a sin. At such times, we're overwhelmed with grief. We think because we're surprised by our sin, then surely God must also be surprised. And then the next thing that uh, happens is we begin to imagine that since God is surprised and there's new information about us, then God's probably renegotiating our entire relationship with Him. He's reviewing it and relook and reconsidering His commitments to love us. See, the depth of the human heart has sin that is new to us to discover, but God knows it on the front end when He calls us and says, I love you. That's the point. God doesn't discover it because we do. He fully knows it, and He knows that we don't begin to know it, but He declares His affection for us, Before we discover it, and when we begin to discover the depths of it, it really throws us off because we think it throws God off. So don't think God is surprised when we're surprised. And don't think God was hasty in His commitment to love us because He didn't understand the gravity of the human problem. He understood it fully when He declared His love over us. What is God thinking when we discover the weakness of our flesh? It is important that we perceive what he's thinking about us in our weakness. That is one of the most essential concepts in the grace of God. We must understand what God is thinking about us when we discover our weak flesh. That's where the crisis comes, right there. Peter denies the Lord and then decides to go fishing. The important question is why was Peter fishing? He was not fishing because the apostolic team needed money. They had enough money in their collection that Judas could steal it undetected. They had plenty of money. It's only eight days after, after the uh, crucifixion. The, John 21 is, uh, the events of John 21 is happening. Peter decided to go fishing. They fished all night, so therefore we know that Peter was not fishing for some sense of recreation. Peter, what was happening? Peter was giving up on what God called him to do. He was going back to his former occupation is what was happening. Something very, very uh, radical was taking place in Peter's life. He was actually going back to his former occupation, saying no to his calling as an apostle. That's what's going on when he goes fishing. Again, it's not a casual Sunday afternoon fishing. He he labors all night. He's, He's back in the family business is what's happening the power of shame. In the crisis of discovering our sinful flesh, we often reason within ourselves it's too painful to reach for the highest things in God if we believe we're going to constantly fail in them, is the idea. Seems easier to settle for living a second-class relationship with Jesus than to to face the pain of failure that goes with having a high vision of being an extravagant lover of God. When we have a high vision to be extravagant lovers of God, that vision necessitates we're going to come up short a number of times. The pain of coming up short causes many people to lose their way in the Lord. And what they do even subconsciously is they logic, they lower the vision so they don't fail, so they don't have the pain, but they walk as a second class citizen because of shame in their life before the Lord. I believe Peter was resigning from his leadership role in God's purpose. Peter felt he would rather resign than fail over it, over and over. If he couldn't stay true before a little servant girl, what would happen in the next 40 years, he reasoned. He didn't feel qualified to be an apostle because his heart was so wounded by his failure in denying Jesus three times. Peter felt he had disappointed the Lord's heart. He couldn't face the Lord because of his failure. When this occurs, we want to run from him instead of run to him. I believe that Peter was intending to return to the fishing business. 
was an occupation that he had been successful at before Jesus ever called him. It was something he could do without a fresh experience in the grace of God. And that's where a lot of people draw back and they say, I want to do what I could do without needing a supernatural supply of the grace of God in the present tense. Some of us feel we can't face the future because we might fail again. Such people become accustomed to a second-rate relationship with the Lord. They settle for a second-rate relationship with Jesus. It's not because they don't love Him any longer. It's because they have so much shame in their life. And that's the crisis that the, that the young bride is facing in chapter 1. They cannot face relating to God, to relating to God with so much shame. This is the crisis Peter was going through. We also sometimes decide to go fishing. Again, we're not talking about an, an afternoon uh, recreation. We're talking about giving up in a substantial way on reaching for the high things because the, the pain of reaching and failing is too great to face because we imagine God is angry and disappointed and that's the point right there. We despise ourselves because we imagine the Lord is despising us, and that's the pain point right there that this passage is addressing. We give up on the vision to be an extravagant lover, which is the highest calling in our relationship with the Lord. We painfully make the decision to settle down and have a second-rate relationship because to reach for the high things and fail is too painful. You know the, uh, the old saying, it's a common saying that it's better to love and lose than not love at all. You've heard that. That's a, you've heard that in the, in the romance literature. It's better to love and lose than ever love at all. And, and the guy reasons, yeah, that's right, unless you lose 20 times in a row. And that's what Peter's saying. I, I can't, to risk and fail is okay, but not, not if I think it's a chronic problem. I would rather draw back and guard my spirit from the pain of failure. And many believers, I have no doubt there's a number in this room right now, your love for God is burning within you, but your, your desire to reach and fail is so risky because of shame that you think, you know, I'm going to inch my way forward so I don't have to face the failure of reaching high and coming up short again. Because to fall short causes so much pain. We imagine God is grieved and angry, exasperated. We think God's upset. We're filled with condemnation and shame. The Lord asked Peter, the same question three times. He asked the same question three times. He says, do you love me? And each time that he asks this to Peter, uh, Peter's heart is troubled, but I believe what is happening is this, and I have this uh, uh, on the notes here. I'll just kind of summarize it to speed up. I imagine the Lord coming to Peter and saying, Peter, do you love me? And I imagine Peter putting his head down and saying, giving the excuses. Lord, uh, I, I didn't mean to, and the Lord stops Peter and says, Peter, let me tell you something about your heart that you don't know. You do love me, Peter. Remember when we were in the garden eight days ago? Yes, I told you two things about your heart. I told you you had weak flesh but a willing spirit. Well, you've understood the weakness of your flesh, and it surprised you, Peter. But what you don't know as well is you do have a willing spirit. You don't only have weak flesh. You do have a yes in your spirit to me, and you do love me. I saw that in you before you even stumbled. I believe Peter answers back something like, he, now the Lord says, now, Peter, do you love me? He goes, well, Lord, it's hard for me to say it. I feel like a hopeless hypocrite. And I imagine the Lord saying, Peter, I see it in your spirit. Now say it. And he goes, I, I, I love you, Lord. I imagine him looking down and the Lord picks, puts his hand out and takes his chin and lifts up. He goes, Peter, look at me again. Do you love me? And I imagine Peter start going, oh, Lord, I hate this. Lord, I'm a hypocrite. I failed you because he's fishing out of despair. Lord says, Peter, you don't understand the makeup of the heart. I love you, Peter, and I know that you love me. He says, now say it. He's actually establishing Peter's confidence to stand as a lover of God. He's restoring his confidence and breaking shame off of Peter. And then the third time, he adds a phrase. He adds a phrase he doesn't answer, uh, that Peter doesn't use the first two times. He goes, Lord, you know all things, and you know I love you. And I believe the phrase, you know all things, comes out of the dialogue 
Lord, you just told me I love you. You know my heart better than I do. I want to draw back. I want to quit being an apostle. I just want to go back to Galilee and be a fisherman. But you know things about me I don't know. And you say I love you. You know everything. You know I love you is how he answered it. And I believe three denials, the shame of three denials is broken off of Peter by the Lord washing him with this question three times. Three times he says, Peter, say it back to me. I am a lover of God. And I believe every time he goes, oh, Lord, this, I don't like this. I'm a hypocrite. No, Peter. I know that you love me. And I believe that the Lord is reinstating Peter back to confidence and boldness in his relationship with the Lord. Oh, that John 21 is such a great passage because John says... He calls himself the one that God loves. And Peter says, I'm the one that loves God. It's the twofold confession. I put them together. I want to say, Lord, like John, the confession of John, I'm the disciple you like. And then I say in my brokenness and in my stumbling, I, you know all things and you know I love you. I just speak right back to the enemy's accusation. I'm not a hopeless hypocrite. I'm a lover of God. You know everything and you know my spirit and you know I love you. That's how the Lord washed Peter. That's how the Lord reestablished him in confidence. The Lord sees our willing spirit more than we do. The Lord's breaking shame off of Peter's heart. What's happening? And I, and I just, we just covered that. God puts a yes in the spirit of everyone that is sincerely born again. That may be new terminology to some people. The day you're born again, God puts a yes in your spirit to Him. It takes God to love God. And it's the yes in your spirit that God put in you that moves the very heart of God when He looks at you. It's bigger than you. Yes, you were voluntary in your response. You did have to say yes to the Lord. But it's the power of His yes in your spirit that makes you lovely before the Lord. Okay. The paradox of grace, dark but lovely. I am dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Don't look upon me, I'm dark because the sun has tanned me. Her twofold confession of faith, I am dark but lovely. Her first spiritual crisis and her first confession of faith are described here. God reveals to her the sinfulness of her heart, but at the same time that she is lovely in the sight of God. And that really makes uh, some folks really uncomfortable to be both and. They want to be either or. The both and, the paradox of grace, troubles them. They, they can't imagine it because their view of God is a God that's angry when he discovers that we have weakness. Dark of heart, but lovely to God. Another way to talk about this is weak flesh, but a willing spirit. The weak flesh is the dark heart, and the willing spirit is lovely before God. The passage is not describing a person who is rebellious, but a sincere believer with weakness. She starts off with this confession. And I have it written in the notes here that I don't believe a person will, will grow consistently Without the knowledge, they're lovely alongside the knowledge that they're dark of heart. If they only see their dark of heart, and a lot of, of, uh, of different streams in the body of Christ go real heavy on dark of heart, but to go dark of heart without emphasizing lovely to God is to destroy our confidence before the Lord and to produce shame-driven believers who are sincere but paralyzed by shame sincere they'll go to the all-night prayer meeting they'll pray and fast they'll do anything you ask they'll sign up for every ministry venture they are dark of heart but they're paralyzed emotionally by shame they never have confidence in their spirit before god and they're never ha they 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 never experience the love that's better than superior to wine they never enter into the romance of the gospel because they're paralyzed by shame Sincere as can be, but paralyzed by shame. They have a closed spirit before God, though very sincere. What I mean by closed spirit, shame causes us to close our spirit before the Lord. There are people that you can worship night and day with a closed spirit. 
A closed spirit says, I love you, I love you, I love you, but God, don't break me, don't be mad, please forgive me, I vow and swear I'll do this. It's that negotiating spirit of legalism that tries to produce something that would motivate God to pay attention to us. God's motivation to pay attention to us comes within His own being, not from you. And He does not want us relating to Him on the presupposition that we motivated him to take an interest in us. That's not how the grace of God works. And so I've seen people, many, many, for years and years, they're so in touch with the fact they're dark of heart, so paralyzed by shame, and they're sincere and they will do anything, but they're inwardly come broken all the time. They never enter into the superior pleasures of the romance of the gospel, which is the delight, the enjoyment, the fascination, the confidence in beauty, the, the wholeheartedness that feels love back, that enjoys the presence of the Lord. The bride's journey begins with this principle that we have just considered in Peter's life. Her journey begins with a spiritual crisis common to every fervent believer. It's a great paradox for a young believer to discover their sin, but at the same time to discover God's love for them, or that they are beautiful in God and beautiful to God. The real issue is one of understanding the divine affections and secondly, one of understanding His imparted beauty to us in the grace of God. That where we can say, I am lovely. I'm dark but lovely. What a powerful place of confidence. I know I have pride, but you are absolutely ravished over me. You like me and I'm good looking. To you, God, in the Spirit. I know I have pride, But you like me and I'm good looking to you, God, in the Spirit. What a place of confidence. And you'll run to God. You'll be abandoned to Him. Because your heart is romanced. Your heart is wowed and wooed by the the unveiling of beauty. The Lord's beauty and your beauty to the Lord. How is she going to relate to God when she discovers her own sinfulness? That's the question of the hour early on. How are you going to relate to God when you discover you have weak flesh, a dark heart? What we do in this crisis is a very important part of our spiritual life. Many people fail this early test, or let's call it this early pressure, this early crisis, and that they run from God instead of run to God because they misunderstand the personality of God. They make the same mistake that Peter did. They resign, they give up, they fall into a mindset of shame, In other words, the stronghold of shame and rejection paralyzes their heart, chokes their heart. A life of shame leads to a life of sin. If you feel dirty before God, I tell you, you will live dirty before God. It's true. You can grit your teeth for three months and stay out of certain things, but long term, in the secret place of your heart, And under pressure, you will yield time and time again if you feel dirty. In front of the, you know, in front of uh, people you care about, and as long as you're at the meeting, at the conference, you could do okay. If you feel dirty, you live dirty. If you feel shameful, you live shameful. If you feel clean, you begin to live clean. If you feel desired, if you feel delighted in, you live entirely different. I tell you, there's nothing more powerful in the earth that a woman who feels loved and clean and filled with dignity and desired, that woman is tenacious in love. She's powerful. There's not very many of them in the earth, but such a woman is tenacious in love. And God's raising up a corporate woman that will feel clean, desired, dignified, and pursued and delighted in. And I tell you, that is the bride that will be tenacious in love in the face of the onslaught of the enemy. Lovely. Yes, I've stumbled. But you like me and I'm good looking to you, God. I know I am because of what you've done and who you are. Some of you, now you've got to watch out. That smile, I can feel it is coming out. You're going, gosh, you know, I could like life after, after all. Some religious traditions go, get that smile off your face. It's God we're talking about. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I forgot. I can feel some of you, that smile is about to break out, and you're about to go just public with it. This is fun, serving God. 
Okay, enough of that. <laughs> I really, I can feel it. Some of you are going, no, wait, wait. I'm telling you, God likes you as much as God likes God. That's stunning. His beauty he gave to you. Four reasons why we're beautiful and lovely to God in the midst of immaturity, not just in heaven, in the midst of immaturity. Number one, the finished work of the cross. Number two, he put a willing spirit in us. Number three, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. It's because of what God's emotions are like. They're filled with desire. And number four, because of the destiny that we have as his son's future bride, the absolute certainty of the finality of our destiny as an adorned, embraced, enthroned bride. Four reasons why you're beautiful to God, even right now. And each one of them, obviously, are vast subjects. Three stages of victory. And the first stage is the one I care about, uh, emphasizing. Sincerity of heart to obey the Lord, yet con constant spiritual failure in a particular area. Here's where a person, we all begin, there's an area we're failing in. But we really want to obey, but we fail and fail and fail. Let me tell you this. Victory begins substantially right there. You are in a substantial place of victory, though it's not complete victory. You go, what? Six billion people on planet Earth, five billion of them, don't have an ounce of concern for Christ Jesus, and you are longing to get free of that area, and the Lord says, victory has substantially began in your spirit. The devil didn't give it to you, and the sinful flesh didn't give it to you. Who gave that longing to you? I don't know. I didn't think much about it. The Lord says, I think a lot of it. Victory begins with the intention to obey, lodging itself by the grace of God in your spirit. Your beauty and your victory begins right there, and I don't mean a little bit. You are substantially different than five billion people on planet Earth who have no concern to obey Jesus in that area you're struggling in. The second level of, of uh, spiritual victory, or we could call it what seems to us to be spiritual, uh, or spiritual beauty, we, we get victory, but we constantly, we still have, the struggle is there, but it doesn't defeat us. Now we think, now that sounds like victory. And then the third one, there are areas in our life where the Lord literally changes our desires so substantially that there's the struggle for that area isn't even there. Most people count number three as the only legitimate victory. When the struggle is completely gone, then they are in victory. Beloved, you are in substantial, but not complete victory, but substantial victory and beauty when the longing is there back at, st at step one. I lay at my bed at night and I say, Lord, this area, I want to get free. Oh, I want to be free. I'm not free. I know I'm good looking to you because of this, Lord. I know you like this. Now watch out, don't smile. Summary, some of us think victory is only when we've subdued the flesh entirely. That's a, that's a wrong idea of victory, to only count it victory at the end. Victory begins substantially. Okay, the dark tents of Kedar were grayish-black tents. They were very common in the geographic area just outside of Jerusalem, or actually all over Palestine and in the Middle East. They were made out of the dark skins of wild goats. Therefore, they speak of darkness, the darkness of flesh. He says, I have these dark tents. I'm like the dark tents, but I'm not only like the dark tents. She's going to say this. She said, I'm dark but lovely. Now she's going to say it again in common imagery of the day. I'm like the dark tents. However, I'm like the white, bright curtains of Solomon as well. The curtains of Solomon were in the holy place in the temple. These curtains were bright white curtains in the holy place. They speak of the inward grace of God and God's glory in her life. The beauty of these curtains were hidden from the common eye. They were only actually seen by the priests. There is a beauty in you that others cannot see. It's like the hidden curtains in the sacred place of Solomon's temple that nobody can see besides the, the, anointed, the anointed ones of that day, the priests. And, and she says this, she goes, I know that I am like dark tents on the outside, but I have an inward work of beauty like the, tents of, like the curtains of Solomon. I am beautiful in the holy place before God. 
even in my struggle. Okay, she becomes self-conscious of her sin. She tells the people around her, don't look at me, I'm dark. I'm like those tents. You don't see that I'm lovely, and you don't see I'm like the bright white curtains of Solomon hidden in the holy place of the temple. You only see my outward. She says, turn away. She's feeling the shame that others and the, uh, from the judgment of others. She understands she was born into the natural world with a sinful heart and sinful tendencies. Her natural inheritance in Adam has made her dark of heart. She says, because the sun, the sun has tanned me. She speaks of living under the influence of the sun. Now remember, Solomon's writing the Song of Solomon, obviously. The sun speaks of the natural realm. In his previous book, Ecclesiastes, he constantly uses the phrase, living life under the sun. It means living life in the natural realm. That's what it means in the writings of Solomon. She cries, the sun has tanned me. My uh, association with natural life has left me impacted by it. I am dark, I'm tanned, I'm made dark because I was born in the natural realm in sin, is what she's saying. And I have more about that. People look at her and they wag their head, they go, you're dark. She goes, yeah, it's my association with the fact that I'm human, I'm, I'm a part of the natural order of things, that it's a fallen order. Okay, her spiritual crisis, rejection and shame. My mother's sons are angry with me. They made me keepers of the vineyard, but my own vineyards I've not kept. Why should I be as one who veils herself by the flocks of your companions? She's, we're going to look at these five pressures related to this spiritual crisis. We'll develop them in the next couple pages. But just She feels rejected, shamed, overworked, distracted from her first love, and serving Jesus at a distance. All of those are described in the language of these next verses. B, her negative experience begins with rejection. My mother's sons were angry with me. She describes being rejected by her mother's sons. Throughout the book, or throughout the song, the mother speaks of the church. Since the bride is born of God through the agency of the church. The symbolism of the church as a mother is used by the Apostle Paul and other uh, 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 New Testament writers. The imagery of the church being the mother, the mother of us all, because it's through the church that our new birth is affected by the Holy Spirit. There's a number of references. There's actually a, it's, it's quite a study in the Old New Testament where the mother and the church are, or the, or the redeemed community at large are, are identified. This is not by any means a complete study, but uh, I'm just uh, letting you know the mother here speaks of the church. So she talks about, my mother's sons were angry with me. We have a, a number of uh, little paragraphs there talking about the mother being an imagery of the corporate church. She describes the beginning of her crisis as being rejected by the angry sons, the sons that were angry with me. She experiences the common crisis of being rejected and misunderstood by the angry sons. These sons are the other members of the body of Christ. The angry sons speak of older yet carnal believers who are angry at her youthful zeal. She was going full speed for Jesus. She wanted the kisses of his word. And she runs right into the angry, those that are angry with her. And they dislike her for two distinct reasons, if not more. First of all, Carnal believers don't like fervent young believers. It doesn't even have to be that specific. Believers with a dull heart don't want to be next to people with a burning heart. It makes them very, very uncomfortable. It makes them feel bad about themselves. So they, they come, they dismiss zeal as legalism. That's the number one way to dismiss zeal. That's the tried and proven way in the body of Christ today to dismiss zeal. It's legalism. But it's rhetoric. Don't buy into it. There is legalism, but don't buy into that rhetoric. And whatever you do, don't use it against a uh, zealous person. So number one reason they're angry is because they're convicted. Secondly, I believe they're probably offended by her pride and her untempered zeal. 
The self-absorbed way she is speaking about her spiritual love needs seasoning. The reason I believe that, she's at the beginning of her journey. And a newly zealous believer, old or young, are almost always untempered. And in their untempered zeal and pride, they cause disruption that they really deserve. I mean, they're the ones responsible. The first reason they caught, made the people anger is because they convicted them. The second reason is because they had untempered zeal and pride. This angers carnal believers. One thing carnal believers are really good at, dull believers, spiritually dull believers, they're really good at picking up when somebody's on fire and they're off base. That's their number one uh, area of discernment. It's how wrong people are that are on fire. They can pick up pride in a second. These newly zealous believers often exalt themselves. Here's, it's, this is a real issue, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to you to, do, to deliver you on the front end. We often exalt ourselves and condemn others who don't express devotion to Jesus in the exact same way we do. They unconsciously set themselves up as a model and a standard of God's highest. In my first uh, five to seven years in the Lord, I just gave a couple examples. I was convinced that the, the standard of being free from the fear of man was preaching in public. I don't mean in public meetings, I mean in restaurants. I mean, I really believe this. I believe if you were going to be like John the Baptist, I was 18, 19 years old, you would preach out on the street somewhere, you know, cause us problems or something, get something going for heaven's sakes. I didn't, it took me a few years, honestly, to figure out that John the Baptist was preaching out in the wilderness 20 miles out and everybody walked out to hear him because they were interested in him. I didn't understand that point. I brought the message to the people, you know. <laughs> And I preached in, uh, on street corners and the college campuses. We'd set up, we'd go into college campuses and right in the cafeteria, we'd set up a sound system. The one group would sing and I was always the preacher. They'd go, you're the preacher. i go, oh, thanks. And I would declare the gospel in the, in the cafeteria. And the people thought I was a total jerk. They said, you are an idiot. And I'd say, persecuted for Jesus. I mean, they got angry. And that was really, that was really out of line for me to do that. Because if I'm going to do it John the Baptist style, I can go in a remote place and they'll all flock out and hear me. I preached at Denny's a number of times. That was our official meeting. No, really. Because they all look around the table and they say, okay, Bickle, you're up. I go, oh gosh, this teaching gift is getting me in trouble. But I understood that, that the standard for being free from the fear of man was public, uninvited proclamation in inappropriate places. I know that doesn't make sense now, but it really made sense then. And the next thing that, that, that I did is that I carried a big old Bible. I had this big old Catholic family Bible that was about six inches thick and about a foot long. For real, I carried it everywhere. Carried it to high school, took it to college, in your face. Heavy Catholic Bible, I took it. And I had a big nine-inch wooden cross because the, the Bible said carry your cross. You think it's funny, but my sister, she can tell you, she, she went, I remember the time she went home to my parents and cried. She said, he is ruining the family name. Stop him. <laughs> but here's the problem. That's cute and all that stuff now. But let me tell you the problem. In my heart, I was convinced everyone who did not do these things were backsliders. I looked at the pastors. And I just said, those lousy Laodicean backsliders. I thought everybody was out to lunch besides me and my little God squad. I interpreted commitment through my own standard, and I caused tremendous trouble, and I rejoiced in persecution, and then the Lord tapped me on the shoulder and says, listen, Mike, you're just out of control. Just shut up. You're about to wreck my whole kingdom. Just be quiet. No, I'm kidding. He didn't say that, but <clears throat> here's my point. I'm, it's true. What I'm telling you is true, but I'm, I'm making fun of it because I'm wanting to touch some of you that, now some of you have more common sense than that, but we raise ourselves up unconsciously as the standard and it's our untempered zeal that is affecting and offending people. And we think it's because we're righteous, it's because we're foolish and proud. It's both and. We are convicting people and we are proud. It's both and. So I believe the sons are angry with her. Their sons are looking at her going, we don't like you. What do they do? They mistreat her. How? By overworking her. She was vulnerable because she was so, so zealous. 
thus willing to do anything to please her beloved Jesus. The old saying, it's easy to whip a willing horse. They made me keepers of the vineyards, plural. They gave her all kinds of responsibility. They worked her to death. She signed up for everything. She kept all the other vineyards, but not her own, because she was so stressed out and overworked. They made her responsible for others. Other vineyards, she being overworked, and therefore she burns out. I read this. I didn't just, I'm not just studying this from commentaries. I know a little bit about this, and some of you do as well. I know what it means to overdo it out of the will of God and to burn out. She's done all the work she's asked to do. She kept all the vineyards, but not her own. She did, she neglected her own vineyard. And, and, it, and uh, number one, the vineyard here speaks of her own heart. She said, They made me keepers of the vineyards, but my own heart I didn't keep. I lost my own way. I signed up for the kisses of his mouth, the kisses of his word, and now I'm overworked. Everyone's angry at me, and my own vineyard's filled with weeds. How many of you can relate to that? Don't raise your hands. Throughout the entire song, her her garden is her own heart before the Lord, her own vineyard. The weeds of shame, sin, and weariness are choking the life out of her garden. She's lost the cry for the kisses of his mouth, which were so strong initially. Taking care of her own vineyard means nurturing her own personal communion with God and doing His will. Next, she expresses her shame over her sin. It's a twofold complaint that is happening in, ver- in, in, in the next, uh, uh, in, well, in verse 6. She feels like the veiled woman who couldn't show her face in public as the prostitute. She says, why should I be like a veiled woman? Why should I serve by the flocks of your companions? She's asking two questions, actually. It's one question, but there's two parts. Why am I like a veiled woman, and why do I serve at such a distance from Jesus? By the way, this veil is not a veil of honor, it's a veil of shame. She cries out, why should I be like the one who veils herself? In the ancient world, a veiled woman was a prostitute. She wore the veil during the day so people couldn't see her face. Speaks of the shame and and, uh, sin that's expressed in her life because her garden isn't being kept. Now she asks the second question within the one statement. Why should I be by the flocks of your companions? She's saying, why should I serve down the road and not near to you like I used to? Why should I serve a far distance from you? She goes, I remember the days when I spent my time in the chamber with the Lord. I was so near you. Now I'm like a veiled woman. I have shame. And now I serve at a distance from you. I'm overworked. My own vineyard is is ruined. And I don't know what to do. Number one, the sons are angry. She's rejected. Number two, a, 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 a woman with a shameful veil. Number three, she's overworked, keeping all the vineyards. Number four, her own heart has weeds in it. She's distracted from her intimacy. And number five, she's serving Jesus at a distance. She's serving down the road. She doesn't have the same nearness she had in the early days. These five common experiences that I believe most of us in this room can understand. Okay. Her desperate cry. Oh, I love this. She breaks out in this cry. And the only reason she could have this desperate cry this desperate prayer, because she had confidence she was lovely to the Lord in the midst of her trials. Tell me, she says. She's asking the shepherd for counsel. Tell me, great teacher. Oh, you who I love, where do you feed your flock? Where do you make it rest at noon? In the midst of the crisis, she cries out a desperate prayer. She remembers that she originally only wanted the kisses of his mouth. Now she wants to get back to the place where Jesus touched her and romanced her heart. She goes, tell me, where will you make me lie down and rest like you did in the early days? I want to get back to where I was. Tell me, oh, you whom I love. The context of this desperate cry for intimacy. She has lost what she has originally experienced in chapter 1, verse 2 and 4. Her vineyard is no longer kept, but she loves him. She sees herself as a lover of, of God. Oh, you whom I love. She didn't say, tell me, 
I'm a helpless hypocrite. She goes, I know I'm a lover of God. It has that Peter, Lord, you know that I love you, though I've just betrayed you. Oh, you that I love. She has the boldness because she knows she's lovely even in her crisis. She goes, I want to know where you feed your flock. It's the prayer of despair. Where do you feed your flock? The key word is you. She says it three times in verse 7. This is the prayer Jesus wants you to pray. He doesn't want you to give up and write yourself off as a hopeless hypocrite. He wants you to say, where will you feed me like you used to? God, I want to get back to base one again. I want to start again. I, I want to restart my life as a lover of God. You know I love you. I am a veiled woman. I'm serving at a, dif- a distance. My own vineyard has weeds in it. I'm broken down. Everything's going wrong. Everyone's angry at me, I know. But you can touch me. Oh, you whom I love, where will you feed me? She wants to be satisfied again with Jesus. It says here, where will you make it rest at noon? A shepherd will tell you that a sheep will only lie down at noon if its stomach is filled. In the heat of the day, a sheep will lie down when if its stomach's filled. She's going, where will you satisfy my spirit? Where will you make me rest at noonday? She's using the language of the shepherd. Where will you satisfy me under the heat of the pressures of the day? Oh, I want the superior pleasures. I want to lie down. I want to experience satisfaction again in the heat of the day. The sun has tanned me. The sun has marked me with sin. But in the very presence of this heat, the very presence of the pressures, I want to be satisfied. I want to lay down. I want to experience the romance of the gospel. Okay. Jesus' glorious answer. Now he speaks. He speaks verse 8, 9, 10, and 11. She speaks verses 5 to 7, and then he speaks verse 8 to 11. He says, if you don't know, O most beautiful of women, O fairest of women, follow in the footsteps of the flock, feed your little goats besides the shepherd's tents. The counseling shepherd. It's all in the imagery of a shepherd, and he's giving her instruction on how to find her path again. To restore her to the paths of righteousness is what's happening here. He hears the desperate prayer in verse 7. Where will you feed me? So now he answers. Number one, he first gives her a general answer. Then number two, he gives her three specific answers. Then he gives her three affirmations to back up the three answers. Let me say again what's happening. He's giving her seven statements. First one is a general answer. Then three specific answers and then three affirmations. Oh, most beautiful. He looks at her most beautiful. Remember in, in chapter 1, verse 4, he, she, he told the, uh, she told the virgins, remembering his love. We will remember your love. We'll be glad and rejoice. We'll remember your love. He is causing her to remember his love and the beauty he's imparted to her. He calls her Ferris. Or the other uh, Bible translations translate it beautiful. I like the word beautiful better. Because it's, it's a word we use in our, in our culture. First, he, he speaks to her heart. He calls her most beautiful. He renews the romance with her again. He goes, you've rightly said you're lovely to me. Now let me say it to you. You stun my heart, my beautiful one. I know that you have a veil on you. I know there's weeds in your garden. I know you're at a distance. But the cry in your heart to love me, I love it. He starts off romancing her, calling her back to the romance of the gospel. That's always where fervency, I believe, is best rekindled in the paradigm of the, bri- the bridal paradigm of the kingdom, the call to the romance of the gospel, where he woos her with the beauty she possesses in him, in her weakness. Now he's going to give the three specific answers. Number one answer. He's going to call her to commitment to body life. He's going to call her to follow in the footsteps of the flock. Number one, he tells her to follow in the footsteps of the flock, to get involved in the body, the footsteps of the flock is the place where all the sheep are. It's where they walk with Christ. He says, get back into fellowship. She says, they're angry at me. They're mistreating me. They're overworking me. They're judging me. I don't want a fellowship with them anymore. She goes, number one, get back in the way of the, of the flock of God again. 
She reestablishes her back into fellowship and out of isolation. Now, this is not an isolation that is motivated by a quest for intimacy. This is an isolation that is motivated because she feels rejected and mistreated and shamed. It's a pain isolation, not a longing for God, private life of prayer. That's not what we're talking about here. She has isolated herself. We know that because he has to tell her to get back involved again. That implies that she wasn't involved because there's no idle uh, exhortation here. If I know that you feel rejected and shamed, get back involved. She reinstates her to fellowship. The next thing he's going to do, the second specific answer, is take care of your God-given responsibilities is the second answer. I want you to feed the little flock that I've given you. She goes, no, last time I worked, it burned me out. He says, no, I don't want you to do what everybody puts in front of you. I want you to feed the ones I give you. I don't want you signing up for every ministry. I don't want you tending every vineyard. I want you to take care of your garden and take care of the little flock I've given you. It may be two and three. Some people think that that would mean they have to be involved in platform ministry to thousands of people. No. He's telling her to say yes to the God-given responsibilities. Now, Elijah, the Lord told him in, in 1 Kings 17, 3. I don't have this in the notes, but he tells him, he says, Elijah, go hide yourself. 1 Kings 17, 3. Then later in 1 Kings 18, 1, he says, go show yourself. There's a time to hide yourself and a time to show yourself in obedience to God. But she was hiding herself out of burnout. There is a time for the Lord to say, go hide yourself. Matter of fact, he told John the Baptist, take 30 years before you even begin your platform ministry. Moses was 40 years in the wilderness. David was 13 years before he began to be king of Israel. Joseph was 13 years in the prison system. There is a place where God tells his servants to hide themselves for the purpose of devotion. It's not an overreaction because of pain. He's telling her now to show herself and to overcome her fear. Being overworked. She goes, now I did that serving the flock thing before. He goes, no, there's a lot of me you will only find in the context of feeding the twos and threes that I give you. Go take care of your little flock. He says, now I want you to do it besides the shepherd's tents. I want you to do it in submission with an open spirit to spiritual authority. That's the third answer. She didn't like this one. She says, no, the last time I did it, they were angry with me. They mistreated me. They misunderstood me. They rejected me. They shamed me. He says, no, I want you to do it with an open spirit. And we develop that. When it comes time to minister, to, to begin to feed the little flock, the Lord says, I don't want you doing it in, an is- in isolation. Somebody asked me at the break, they said, why does she say, draw me, in verse 4, but let us run? Drawing is singular, because it's intimacy. Running is plural, because it's ministry. God does not want us running in ministry with an, with an independent spirit. He wants us in ministry, in team ministry, submitted to one another in the body where there's safety. I tell you, I, I know from personal experience, I've been tempted to go run Either forget that little flock, and if I say yes to it, to do it with an independent spirit because God's leaders, myself, all of God's leaders are broken and imperfect, and whatever leaders He puts over you, they will be broken and imperfect, and God wants to do something with you with broken and imperfect leaders. He says, do it next to the shepherd's tents, not in an isolated spirit. She doesn't like this answer, by the way. She goes, oh, where will you feed me? He says, well, in the body, get back in the body. No, they're mean, get back in the body. Follow the footsteps. Now I want you to get, I want you to tear up your resigning, uh, you know, you, you resign, tear up your resignation, and start feeding the little flock I give you. No! No, every time I feed them, they get angry. No. Nope. And I want you to do it next to the shepherd's tents with an open spirit to spiritual authority. Oh! She goes, no, I want you. He says, you will find me in that context. Now he's going to reaffirm her three ways. Her sincerity. Oh, this is so beautiful. Though we're out of time, but it's all in the notes here. He says, I've compared you, my love, to my filly among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments. Your neck with chains of gold. We will make you ornaments of gold with studs of silver. What happening, what's happening now is he's going to affirm her. The first thing he says to her, it's like when he gave her the three instructions. He says, most beautiful. Now, but now he's going to affirm her. He starts up with my love. Every single time he addresses her, he starts with, I love you or you're good looking. Every single time he talks to her, he says, I love you 
or you're good looking or sometimes both. I like the way you look and I really like you. Over and over, every single conversation, he begins it that way. That is how God approaches weak people. I'm telling you, it's the truth. He sees her, strong desire. He says, I've compared you to the fillies or to the horses of Pharaoh's chariots. The greatest, most trained, skilled horses in the earth. And, he's, and he likens her strength to them. Now, you're going to have to read the notes to see what the Lord sees strength in her. She goes, no, no, Lord, you don't understand. Veiled, shame, remember, unkept, weeds in the garden, at a distance. He says, but the cry in your spirit, you are like a trained and skilled war horse before me. And again, it's the, it's the uh, comparisons. It's his grid of the human spirit of the redeemed is so different than our grid. What he calls beautiful and what he calls strong is so different than what we call beautiful and what we call strong. And he affirms her three ways. And then in verse 11, you're going to have to read that on your own because we ran out of time. And then verse 11, he promises, we will make you ornaments of gold. He promises what he told Peter, I will make you a fisher of men. He says, I will make you a jewel of divine character. I will cause you to be... Uh, uh, an ornament with studs of silver. Silver speaks of redemption. Gold speaks of divine character. I'm going to finish what I began in you. Me and the Father and the Spirit, we are going to work in you until you are a finely crafted jewel of gold in terms of your character and your victory. I promise you victory in the areas you stumbled and you will be an agent of redemption. Silver always speaks of rede- almost always in the Bible speaks of redemption. I will make you a fisher of men. That's silver. And I will cause you to be a mature lover of God. That is gold. He ends with that promise over her after he affirms her. Beloved, this is how the Lord looks at us. I'm going to leave you to go study that out because we couldn't develop each one of them. And you can study it in any number of commentaries. And there, most of them are similar in their approach in the symbolism because the symbolism is biblical symbolism. The Bible des- describes the Bible. Let's stand. The Lord says, so you feel like a shamed, veiled woman. You feel like your garden's unkept. People are angry with you. You're serving at a distance. You know what the Lord wants to hear from you? Verse 7, tell me, O you whom I love, where will you feed me again? And the Lord says, you're beautiful to me. Get involved in the body. Take care of the ones I give you. Have an open spirit to authority. Then he says, oh, he says, and he affirms her one after he goes, you're like a trained war horse to me. And I promise you, I will finish what I began in you. You will be gold. You will be a lover of God. Jesus said, I, I advise you to get gold refined by fire. He tells her here, I'll give you that gold. I promise you, I will make you a choice, a choice jewel, an ornament of gold and silver, of redemption and of purity. Amen. We don't have to draw back in shame. We have to cry out. He wants to hear you. I want you right now, just in the privacy of your own life, your heart, I want you to pray verse 7. I want you to say, oh Lord Jesus, where will you feed me? Where will you feed me again? Where will you satisfy my spirit that I could rest in the heat of the day? You're speaking that before the Lord. Name of Jesus. Everybody just close your eyes. Let's lock into the Lord right now. Don't lose this moment. I'm not saying this negative, but I'm still, about half of you are still just kind of spectator. Just, this is a time to do something in your heart now, not just to, not just to read the menu. This is a time to actually eat eat now. You and the Lord. Nobody else is looking. Lord, I feel like a veiled woman. I feel shame ridden. Lord, I feel like I'm at a distance from you. The Lord wants to hear the cry of your heart. He wants to hear the cry to be restored. He wants you to say, I know I'm dark. Everybody knows I'm dark. Everybody knows outwardly I have the tints of Kedar. I'm dark, but I'm beautiful to you. You love me, and I'm good looking to you in the spirit. The Lord promises you he will 
make you an ornament of gold and silver. He will make your heart like gold and He will make your ministry with silver. Redemption. He will use you. Simply what we're doing, we're doing what they said in the theme. We're remembering His love is better than wine. That's what it said. We will remember your love. That's what we're doing right now. We're remembering His affection. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.